Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, in your heart, brethren, there's a throne and there's a cross. If you went to the true plan of salvation we talked to about in part one, if you truly went to the plan of salvation, you got saved, that throne that you have in your heart, now you've got a cross in there too. And that's what we're going to be talking about, the throne and the cross. Everybody's got a throne in their heart. Everyone does. Lost and saved. But when you get saved, you go to Calvary and you get your cross. And we're going to talk about who's on the throne and who's on the cross. But now we're getting into part two, which is who's on the throne. Who's on the throne? Okay. Before, uh, John 3.30. King James Bibles. King James Bibles. God's perfect written word in English. If you don't have a King James Bible, contact this ministry and we will get you a King James Bible. Okay? It's God's perfect written word. This is what I preach from because it's perfect. This is what led me to Christ. A brother led me into Christ through the King James Bible. It's the only way I was able to find the true plan of salvation. We talked about this in part one. You know, I was a false convert most of my life. Why? Because I didn't know about the King James Bible until I turned 35. I didn't know about the Bible version issue. I didn't know about the true plan of salvation until I turned th until someone came to me and said, Hey, this brother in Christ online, he's doing some good studies. You should look up the Bible version issue. I looked up the Bible version issue, studied it hardcore. Then I got the King James Bible, and then I started studying the gospel and the doctrines, and then I had to come to a point where I followed the gospel and the King James Bible, and God saved me. Okay. John 3.30, the King James Bible is God's perfect written word. John 3.30. You have a throne in your heart. That's the first one we're going to talk about. The throne that's in your heart. He must increase. Talking about Jesus Christ. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus Christ. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Brothers says Christ, do not be deceived. When we get into this about the throne in your heart, we're going to be talking about that. Only one person can be on that throne. Only one person. Oh, no, no, we can share the throne. Or, I can, or people, we can have multiple people on the throne. No, you can only have one person on the throne. And we're, the last one we're going to get to is Jesus. Is Jesus on the throne? We're going to talk about things that can be on the throne other than Jesus Christ. Is Jesus on the throne? That's the question. Okay. First person that can be on the throne, remember you can pause the video and turn to the scriptures because we're going to be going through a lot of them. I'm trying to, down, trying to shorten the scriptures a little bit so I can actually turn with you. So I'm going to start looking into that in the future. So please forgive me, brothers. I, I love the Lord. I love His Word. I want, to be, I want to have the most solid foundation when I'm trying to do preaching. But I do understand that sometimes I could be going a little overboard. All right? So forgive me. Forgive me. The first person that's on the throne is me, myself, and I. Is that, what, is that what's happening with you, brother, sister Christ? When you first got saved, you got off your throne and you gave Jesus your throne. He started making changes in your life. And somewhere along the line, you got tripped up and you kicked Jesus off the throne. And now you're back on the throne. Has that happened, brother, sister Christ? 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 10. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise governments, presumptuous are they, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. You say, well, this is Second Peter. This is, this is a different dispensation. Because I do, I believe once you get to Second Peter, it's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? Denying the Lord that bought you and then going to hell? That's not for today. You can end up denying the Lord, but he won't deny you. If we suffer for him, we shall also reign for him. If we deny him, he will deny us that, that inheritance, the millennial reign. But he can't deny himself. So I understand 2 Peter is a different dispensation. But here we can get instruction in righteousness, brother. Just like with John 3.30 that we just read there. He must increase and I must de decrease. Yeah, that's in the Old Testament before Jesus died. The New Testament doesn't come in until the death of the testator. That's Old Testament. But we can learn from it. What does that mean? We need to put our flesh down. We need to put ourselves down so Jesus can be number one in our life. 
We must decrease so he can increase. Are you putting the flesh down? That's, that's a little ahead of myself. But we're using this for instruction and righteousness. So you have people that are walking after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness. Usually that's why you kick Jesus off the throne when it comes to me, myself, and I. I want, I want. Jesus is sitting on the throne and he says, no. And you know what you do? You kick Jesus off the throne and sit on the throne and now you say, yes. You walk after the lust of the flesh and here's the thing. You say, yes. What is that? Self-willed. It's no longer God's will that matters. It's this person's will. Me, myself, and I. My will comes first. Is that happening with you, brother, says Christ? Have you kicked Jesus off the throne and found out that you're on the throne and you're saying how it goes? It's got to be my way. I'm going to do things my way. I get what I want. And I'm getting ahead of myself again. And I don't care how much of the scripture i got to mess up to make myself feel better about it. You know that power of positive thinking. I can talk myself out. You know what the power of positive thinking is? It's talking yourself out of conviction most times. Most times. I'd say 9 out of 10 times. Maybe 8 out of 10 times. It's mostly done that the way the lost world uses power of positive thinking. It's about talking yourself out of conviction. It's about talking yourself out of doing things, God, the consequences of overlooking the consequences that are happening to you if you're truly saved and born again, the chastisement of the Lord, of not doing things God's way, doing things your way. Turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Is Jesus on the throne? Or are you on the throne? If you're on the throne, you're going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you're going to be walking after the flesh. You're not carnally minded. Romans 8, that's not Romans 8. Romans 8 is carnally minded. It's the state of your mind. The state of your mind is you still love the Lord. And you still feel bad about what you're doing. You have conviction. And you're miserable because you're truly saved. But when Jesus isn't on the throne, and you're on the throne, you tend to walk after the flesh. And the Holy Spirit's there telling you what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is wrong, what you're doing is wrong. You've got to quench the Holy Spirit, and you've got to really sear your conscience with the hot iron to not repent and come back to a standing point after falling. I know brethren that are stuck in a falling spot. They've been in the falling state for years now. Why? Because they've seared their conscience with a hot iron. They've quenched the Holy Spirit. They're ignoring it. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. When someone gets saved, you've got that war. Oh, the war isn't there. They're just 100% fleshly. They didn't get saved. They didn't truly repent. Paul's saying this is the state of someone who's saved. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to another. And when you give in to the flesh and ignore the spirit, kick Jesus off the throne... So they that, that, let's say, contrary one to another, so that, that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Who's, who's in charge? Me, myself, and I. Whose will is it? I pray all the time now, especially these days, that God's will be done. How many of you do that, brother? I'm not doing this to be a pat on the back, no. You don't have to, but I believe in the Bible where it said, I can't remember the verse, but I read a verse where it talked about praying for God's will to be done. I don't have this off the top of my head. If you, if you can find it, brothers, put it in the comment section, please, please. But when I go to do, okay, here's my plans today. If God wills, I'd like to get this done today. If God wills, I'd like to do that. How, do you, how many of you actually do that? Or do you have that attitude, I'm going to do this today, and I'm going to do that today? You say, well, it's a little, it's just, you're just being a little picky. And I'm just throwing this out there for you, brothers of Christ. So they cannot do the things that I would, that you would. Verse 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. We're not going to explain all of them, but we're going to go through all of them. What happens when me, my, why does me, myself, and I get put on the throne? Why? Why does someone kick, why would, you think that's stupid? Why would anybody kick Jesus off the throne? 
You got saved. You came to him broken and you had sorrow for your wicked sin that your sin was sending you to hell and you gave your, you believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessed both in prayer, asked God to save you. You gave that old man at the foot of the cross. Why? Why would you do this? Because you get it, like, like it talks about, there's a war going on between the flesh and the spirit. Sometimes the flesh wins. And when the flesh wins, you kick Jesus off the cross. And now you're sitting on it. But the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery. That's why people kick Jesus off the, uh, off the, saved sinners will kick Jesus off the throne. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Witchcraft. Hatred. Variance. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Jesus gets kicked off the, front, uh, off the throne so you can have strife. Railing for railing, backbiting and whispering, mocking, name calling. You kick Jesus off the throne so you can do what you want, feeding the flesh. I want, I want, I want. My will comes first. Strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness. Drunkenness. I lost my ex-wife to, to alcohol, to drunkenness, and dr she was an alcohol, uh, alcohol, that's the world's term, but the Bible term is drunkard. She was a drunkard and she was a drug addict. And when she got drunk and, and drug addict, it was all about the flesh, the flesh reigned supreme. She would mock God in these times. Uh, she'd mock God's word. I was newly saved. I didn't know any better. I tried to, uh, not newly saved. I, I wasn't newly, newly saved. I was new to this situation. I'll say it like that. I was new to this situation. And I tried to reason with her while she was drunk and high. And I learned the hard way. You can't reason with somebody that's drunk and high. You can't. So when I was quoting scriptures to her, she would mock the scriptures. She would mock the Lord. She got really into things, bad things. Okay? Jesus wasn't on the throne. I don't believe she was saved. But one thing I am sure of, Jesus wasn't sitting on the throne. But this is Christ, for those who are saved, who's sitting on the throne? In the end, I had to choose Jesus Christ and I lost my wife. Revelings and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in times past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That that spiritual kingdom, that spiritual fellowship with God. When you kick Jesus off the throne, you lose your fellowship with God. Now, brothers and sisters, I told you about my wife. I lost my daughter to the world. She was getting into video games, and she was getting into um, uh, goth, vampires, and stuff like that. I tried witnessing to her. I tried to show her the right life to live when she came to visit. I lost her to the world. I had to choose Jesus Christ first, and let. And if she doesn't want Jesus Christ, she has to go her own way. She died when she she was a little over 17 years old when she passed away. Okay. I lost brethren. Some some I believe are lost. Some I believe are saved. I lost them to Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, satanic style music. Some to porn. They go back to porn. Some to fornication, drunkenness. And all these things that we're, we're reading right here. What happened? When, if they're truly saved and born again, what happened? They kicked Jesus Christ off the cross. Out of the cross. They kicked him off the throne. They kicked Jesus off the throne. And they put themselves on the throne. And now they're being led by the flesh. They're, go, they're pleasing the flesh and doing the will of the flesh. Me, myself, and I. They're not doing God's will. And when you do that, brothers and sisters in Christ, it'll mess up your walk with the Lord. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Who's on the throne? You know, know what the evidence is when Jesus Christ is on the throne? Verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law let's go back to that again the spirit the fruit of the spirit is this love have you seen some brethren that are starting to get very hateful brothers and sisters christ they're getting hateful and bitter 
They're angry to the point where, yeah, you can be angry with the cause, you can be angry without a cause. Either way, you need to give that anger to the Lord, because if you don't, that anger will fester and turn into bitterness. And that bitterness will fester and it'll turn into hate. Have you seen men, like even men in ministry, have you seen men in ministry that they used to have, they used to be humble, they had a peace about them, which we're going to get to the next one, they had a peace about them, they had joy, long, they were long-suffering, no matter what they had to go through, they didn't let that phase them and change them. So they get them to lose their temper, to get, the, you know, that hate coming in, that anger, gentleness, goodness, faith. I've known men, the great men of God in ministry, that they've kicked Jesus off the throne. And now they don't have much love for the brethren. They don't have much love for the lost world, preaching the gospel to them. They don't have much love for the Lord's word and how they handle the word, Lord's word. Not just men in ministry, but brothers and sisters in Christ. Their joy is gone. Now you can lose your joy because you're on the wrong path, or you can get sorrowful about how bad the world's getting, or the, uh, the condition of the body of Christ. I understand that kind of sorrow that, that you go to God, and God will give you back that joy. Okay? If you get into the world, you, turn, you go back to putting God, if you take yourself off the throne, and you put God, Jesus Christ back on the throne, He'll give you that joy back. He'll give you that peace back, that long-suffering. That gentleness, that goodness, that meekness. Remember, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. How many people behind the camera are yelling? Losing their temper and yelling. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Their long-suffering, gentleness. These are the fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is, and it goes through these things. When you see someone who has problems with these, that this isn't evident... You see people that have all these flesh issues? It's because Jesus isn't on the cross. They might be a babe in Christ like I was. Please understand. They might be a babe in Christ. And God's just now getting to working on them. There's that. There's that. They could be, have a lot of these flesh issues. But they're a babe in Christ. That's there. But you come across somebody. Oh, I've been saved for 40 years. And they have all, a lot of these flesh issues. They've kicked Jesus Christ off the cross. Or cross. I keep saying cross, forgive me. The throne. We'll get to the cross. I got the cross in my head and my heart too. Um, but the throne. They kicked Jesus off the throne or Jesus was never on the throne to begin with. People always get on me. Oh, you just think they're lost. No, I said, if, if they have all these flesh issue, flesh issue problems, I'm going to err on the side of caution and I'm just going to preach the gospel to them. They might be saved, but I'm going to take them back to step one why they got saved, why they needed to get saved, who it is that saved them, and who it is they're supposed to be serving. Who's supposed to be on that throne of the heart? Jesus Christ is. All right. Evidence that you, your walk with the Lord is good is you have those things, brothers and Christ. And those things can be faked. Behind a camera, those things can be faked. But sooner or later, the truth comes out. That's how God works. Verse 24. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the afflictions of the lust. We'll get to that when it comes to the cross. You've got that cross now that you're carrying with you. You're supposed to be on the cross. Jesus is supposed to be on the throne. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another. Provoking one another? Like I said, I had to redo this video. Because I said some things that were kind of provoking. I don't want to provoke people to anger. I don't want to provoke people. I want to encourage you, brothers and Christ, to live for Jesus Christ every day. Start your day with the Word of God and prayer. End your day with the Word of God and prayer. Sanctification. Being a servant to one another. Loving one another. Being there for one another. You know what gets in the way of that? Me, myself, and I. We're not going to get into charity, but charity is self-sacrifice. Me, myself, and I come last. Okay. You can easily fall into the trap of me, myself, and I. And like I said, you can wrestle, wrest the scriptures and try to act like you have charity when you don't. Not if me, myself, and I come first. You definitely don't have charity. 2 Peter 3.16. Turn to 2 Peter 3.16. Bottom line, brothers and Christ, it comes down to the I want, I want, I want. Don't get me wrong. The Bible says, Make your, let, let your request be made known unto God. In prayer. 
There's times I sit with God and say, hey, this is a need. This is a want. Lord, I want this, but I don't need it. If it be your will, Lord, please can I have this? But Lord, I really need this over here. If it be your will. It still has to come down to if it be your will. Because God, when, it come, when push comes to shove, brothers and Christ, God knows definitely what we need. Better than we do. Okay. But you get these brethren, because this is for saved sinners, you get these brethren that kick Jesus off the cross and now are off the... Uh, forgive me. You kick Jesus off the throne. You kick Jesus off the throne and you sit on the throne and it's all about I want, I want, I want. And what these people do that stay in that state, you can do that. I've done it. But I kicked Jesus off the throne in my life. I just told you, I fought him for two years. And then for the next two years after that, there was times I fought him, just off and on. It took a long time for God to get me to, you know, to where I am today. It's not something that's easy. It's your walk with God. Okay? But I fought him. I kicked him off. And then I let him back on. He chastised me until I let him back on the throne. His throne. When you have a brother in Christ or sister in Christ that kick Jesus off the throne, they're ignoring the chastening of the Lord, they refuse to let Jesus back on the throne, you'll see that they like to rest the scriptures to justify how they're doing things. 2 Peter 3.16 As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, which are some things are hard to be understood. Now don't get me wrong, there's babes. Like I said, when you're a babe in Christ, God's working on you. And he starts with milk. He gives you the basics and gives you the milk to help you get along. And once you can handle the milk and you've got the milk down really good, God starts giving you the meat. There's that part of this, this verse that's talked about. Which they that are unlearned and unstable, unlearned, hard to be understood, unlearned, we just explained that. There's milk, there's meat. But it says, and unstable. People that are getting into the flesh. They're starting to be, becoming the me, myself, and I. I want. My will comes first. I want. What do they do? They rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. You'll see that. Uh, brother, that's not what that verse means. Uh, brother, you're, you're failing that verse, and now you're trying to change that verse so it makes it look like it's not talking about you. It is talking about you. How many times have I come across and some of the other brethren that are trying to help other brothers and sisters of Christ out because we love you, how many times do you come across someone who tries to wrestle the scriptures to make them feel better about how they're living and their choices and what the, basically that they're on the throne? I've done it. I've come across brothers and sisters of Christ that have done it. And I've done it and had to get corrected. Oh yeah. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this is for you to exhort you. Who's on the throne? Is Jesus Christ on that throne? Or somewhere along the line, did you kick him off so you could be on the throne? Something to think about. The next thing that can be on the throne, this is for the men. This is for the men. And a little bit for the women. Okay. The next thing that can be on the throne is women and children ruling over them. Okay. Women and children ruling over you for the brethren. And don't get me wrong, Sisters in Christ, will we talk a little bit about how sometimes you can put other people on the throne, kick Jesus off the throne, so pleasing a lost husband? When you're, you know, we're getting into that. We're going to get into that. Okay. But women and children ruling over them. I turn to Isaiah 3.12. Isaiah 3.12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. What happens when children are their oppressors and women rule over them? O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. What happens is, is you've got children ruling over men and women ruling over men, that Jezebel spirit we're going to get into. And what happens is, is they start resting the scriptures as they, as they do unto their own destruction that we read in 2 Peter 3.16 for instruction in righteousness. They start turning their back on the word of God. They kick Jesus off the throne so their wife can be sitting on the throne of their heart. Sometimes they kick Jesus off the throne so their children can be sitting on the throne. I've seen that happen. 
I, I, the compromise, brothers of Christ, compromise, compromise, compromise. Now, the Bible talks about, I don't have it in my notes, but the Bible talks about, Paul warns brothers and sisters in Christ that get married. Some are called to get married, some are not called to get married. But God calls you to get married, the one thing that you're going to have to watch out for, like when you get saved, you have to start putting down the flesh. When you get married, one of the things you've got to watch out for, is it wrong to please your husband, or is it wrong to please your wife? No, it isn't. By, by all means, no, it isn't. Is it wrong to please your husband and please your wife? Forsaking the scriptures? Compromising the word of God? Compromising pleasing God first and foremost? Then does it become wrong? Absolutely. And Paul warns that you can fall into that trap of trying to please your husband over pleasing God. Or the husband trying to please the wife over pleasing God. You can please your wife. You can please your husband. But be careful that God, make sure that God comes first. His word comes first. Pleasing God comes first. All right. Who's on the throne? Some, you can kick Jesus off the throne so me, myself, and I can be on the throne. But you can also kick Jesus off the throne so somebody else can be sitting on the throne. What we're talking about here is a wife gets set on the throne and the man... And the man starts getting led by the wife. 1 Timothy 3.4 1 Timothy 3.4 One that ruleth his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Subjection. They're under your authority. They're not ruling you. You're leading them, and you're ruling them and telling them, hopefully a Bible-believing, God-fearing father, you're telling them, you're raising them in the admonition of the Lord, and you're teaching them to fear God, and that God's way is the way that we're supposed to do things. And when they get older, like become young men, then they can decide whether they want to get saved or not. Okay. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house. Brothers that are married and have children, are you ruling your own house? Or, or is your wife ruling it? Are your children ruling it? We already got into this. I got into this with a brother in Christ that his wife was leading him down the wrong direction because his wife's on the throne and she's leading him and he's not pleasing God, he's pleasing his wife. And he turned it back on the order of authority. God, man, woman, child. He used to believe this. He does not rule his own house well. Right? How shall he take care of the church of God? Real quick. This brother in Christ, I believe he's saved. I really do. He's just lost his way. He's kicked Jesus off the throne. He has no business preaching the word of God or leading a fellowship. If Jesus isn't on the throne and he's not ruling his own house well. This goes for everyone. It goes for everyone. It goes for me. But it says, Christ, I had to step down and I stopped making videos. I point at my computer over here. I had to stop making videos for four to six months. Because my house was not in order. I was not ruling my own house. Well, I had to step down. That's God's way. Who's sitting on the throne? Verse 6. Not a novice left being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Okay, it's talking about the office of a bishop. But for instruction righteous, men are supposed to be ruling their own home. You're supposed to be the head of the household. You're supposed to be leading. Is Jesus Christ on the, on the throne? Right. Or is your children getting on the throne? Revelation 2.20. Revelation 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. Suffer that woman. Wait a minute. Jezebel's been dead for thousands. It's talking about a Jezebel spirit. The attitude that Jezebel had, acting like Jezebel, okay. which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, to commit fornication and idols. You say, what does that have to do with putting a woman? When Jesus is on the throne, that's who you're worshiping. When you put me, myself, and I on the throne, you start doing self-worship. You become an idol. 
When you put your wife on the throne, she becomes an idol. You're worshiping her. You're not worshiping Jesus Christ. Because if you're worshiping Jesus Christ, he's the one in charge. He's the one commanding. And you're doing your best to obey. I said you're doing your best to obey. When you fail him, you repent, you forsake, and you get your heart right with him. But he's the one in charge. When you let your wife sit on the throne, now she's become your lowercase g God. She's the one you're worshiping. She's the one you're trying to please. It becomes idolatry. If you put your children on the throne, it becomes idolatry. That Jezebel spirit. 1 Corinthians 11.3 here it is, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The head of the woman is the man. Are you leading your house? Are you the head of the house, as they say? The head of the household? Or did you compromise and let your wife be the head of the household? A lot of men, I've heard this say, saying, a lot of men let the women be in charge so they can goof off. They don't have to take responsibility and they can goof off. Those men are wrong. Once again, they let the woman be in charge so they can goof off because me, myself, and I is who's on the throne, not Jesus Christ. What we just read there, the head of the, every man is Christ. The man doesn't have ultimate authority. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, and everyone has to bow down to me. That's, the, that's when you have me, myself, and I on the throne. But if Jesus is on the throne... You're going to act differently. You're the head of the house, but you make sure that that foundation of the house is the Word of God. That things are getting done God's way. That that home, you provide a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, and that wife is to keep that home that way. You provide it, you set it up that way, she keeps it that way. That's why the Bible says she's to be a keeper at home. She keeps the house a Bible-believing, God-fearing home. When she starts wrecking it, I speak from experience. But you have brethren that, like I said, the wife's on the throne and they turned on this. Oh no, that's just, that's not talking about authority. And, and no, the husband has no authority to tell his wife, you know, what to do and everything. No, no, no. She has the authority to tell him what to do. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.11 let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Okay, this talks about, you know, when it comes to the Word of God. She's to learn in silence, and she's to ask her husband at home if she has questions about the Word of God. That's why husbands, men of God, you need to know this book. You need, I, well, I work eight hours. I, I don't care. God doesn't either. You work eight hours a, a, a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, five days a week, six days a week. You need, still need to take time to be in this book. Start your day with the book, end your day with the book. You need to be studying the Word of God. Learn from great men of God so you know the book, so you can teach your wife. And when she has questions, you have the answers. And if you don't have answers, you know where to go get them so you can answer your wife's questions when she has questions. Okay? That's what's, put, that's, a, that's, that's what's put on the brethren that are married. You need to be washing your wife by the watering of the word, the Bible says. She's not to usurp the authority of over the man. Okay? Why is this? Oh, because God just loves men and hates women. No, 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 no. That's not why. That's not why at all. See, they always come back with, the men just want to be, have all the authority. I don't have any authority. Jesus has all the authority in my life. I know brothers in Christ that are married to amazing women. The Bible talks about who can find a virtuous woman. They've had virtuous women that they're married to. God doesn't look at that man and says, I prefer that man over the woman. Yeah, that's not God. That has nothing to do with it. And they know it, and the sisters in Christ know it. Why is, it, why is the order of authority set that way? God, man, woman, child. Verse 13, let's see what the Bible actually says. Verse 13. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. God created man first. Man was created in the image of God. Man and women were created in the likeness of God, body, soul, and spirit. But in the New Testament, it says, the, once again, it reiterates, the man was made in the image of God, but the woman, but the woman was taken from the man. 
The woman is of the man. You can read all about creation, but it, creation was one of the reasons. Adam was for, first formed. That's who he created first. Here's the second reason. And Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. The Bible talks about the weaker vessel. Right? Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in the faith, charity, holiness, with sobriety. Some women that get married, they have, you have, a, like I said, feminism is hardcore in these days. The spirit of Jezebel is all over hardcore these days, brother, sisters in Christ. And the Bible talks about number, the one, number one thing that I've seen that helps women stay within the boundaries that God set for them and really serve God by being a keeper at home. What really helps them is to stay busy with their hands. And what better way to stay busy with your hands than to have children? Okay? How many times you've heard that saying, these, these children are a handful? Okay? It's meant to be that way. It's meant to keep you busy and happy and joyful and peaceful being a mother and being a keeper at home. Okay? That's how God intended it. And today, with the Jezebel spirit, everything's coming back and everyone's fighting and, oh, I gotta. You know, I gotta have it. women have to go to college, and women, have, the girls, you know, have to go to college. The teenage girls, and they get up there, and we have to have our own career. We have to have our own income. We have to have our own vehicles. And this is no longer my husband's home; it's our home. That's feminism. That's Jezebel. That's that Jezebel spirit. You know, one of the things my ex-wife she would threaten me with. She threatened because I wouldn't. I have only one truck. I'm, I'm not a very rich man or anything. I have one truck and I wouldn't let her go to town to get drunk and get high with the, with the homeless. And she wound up stealing my truck at night anyway. She found my spare keys and ended up stealing my truck anyway. But the point is, is she threatened me by saying, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get me a job so then I can get my own vehicle and then I can do what I want when I want. Who was on the throne? It wasn't Jesus Christ. Me, myself, and I were on the throne, or that Jezebel spirit was on the phone, uh, on the throne. And this gives me to the, the sisters in Christ. We talked about it a little bit. You can put your husband on the throne sometimes when you try to please him above pleasing God. But this now we're going to go to the sisters in Christ. You can put the Jezebel spirit on the throne, or your children can be on the throne. We talked about this. When you have your children, remember the order of authority: God, man, woman, child. Child are supposed to be under the obedience of their mother. They're to listen to their mother. They're to do what their mother says. When your child starts running you, sisters in Christ, then you, and you allow it and you compromise the word of God and you start pleasing, trying to please your children over pleasing God, A, you're going to spoil the child. The Bible talks about spare the rod, spoil the child. But your child can start ruling over you too, sisters in Christ. And you can start putting your children on the throne and kick Jesus Christ off the throne. But more of what I see today, sisters in Christ, and I love you, I love you, is today the hardest thing to fight is that Jezebel spirit. It's everywhere. It's in Hollywood movies, TV shows, video games, anime, cartoons, children's cartoons. It's in um, the music industry. It's in politics. It's in commercials. It's in the school systems. It's been force-fed to, to the little girls from, from a young age. To all the sisters in Christ, they can all, I, I, if you're honest, you can raise your hand and say, I have, I've heard testimonies from sisters of Christ. The number one thing that they tend to struggle with more than anything is that Jezebel spirit. And they confess it because they love the Lord. They want Jesus Christ on the throne and they want to do things God's way, which means having a head, husband or a man, so a man in a, as a head covering. So what happens today is sisters in Christ, you can fall, you can fail the Lord by kicking him off the throne and allowing that Jezebel spirit, that Jezebel, that woman Jezebel, to be sitting on the throne. Or you kick him off so me, myself, and I can be on the throne. My will comes first. I do what I want. 2 Timothy 3.1 This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, Proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, 
despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. This is the lost world. When they don't have that cross, all they have is the throne. But can you start trying to resurrect the old man? Could you see yourself in here a little bit? A little bit? Trying to resurrect the old man? Be careful. You're kicking Jesus off the throne. When the talk, Bible talks about resurrecting the old man, the old man was on the throne. Who's supposed to be on the throne of the heart, brothers and sisters in Christ? Jesus Christ. He's supposed to be on the throne. We're supposed to be set apart from this wicked world. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Now this is where the head cover for the sisters of Christ, this is where that head covering of the man comes in. Verse 6, for of this sort, this sort, remember they, it said have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. A lot of women today in this world, the lost women in this world, are getting easily deceived, so easily deceived today. Why? Because they don't have the head covering. And someone comes along with a form of godliness, and they lead them astray. Here it is, verse 6. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts. And those men that are leading them away, they're ever learning, and they will be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But for this study, brothers, sisters in Christ, for the sisters, silly women laden with sins, i got to have it my way. My will comes first. Me, myself, and I come first. You know, it's not just the sisters of Christ. It's, brothers, it's for brothers and sisters. You know what causes you to really fall apart? That, that order of priority. Like so There's order of authority, and then someday we'll do a study on the order of priority. God and His Word comes first. Your walk with God comes second. If you're a man in ministry, the ministry comes third. If you're not a man uh, in ministry or the sisters in Christ, it's God and His Word comes first, your walk with the Lord comes second, the brethren come third, and the lost world comes fourth, and me, myself, and I come last. Dead last. What happens when you get really messed up? When you jump the line, you put me, myself, and I all the way to, first, to number one. Or you put your wife to number one, or your children to number one, or your husband to number one. For this sort are they that creep into house and lead captive silly women laden with sins. Jesus isn't on the throne. Because if Jesus was on the throne, you'd be under a head covering. And people always say, Jesus is my head covering. We just read how Jesus just said, the man is supposed to be the head of the wife. Jesus is the head of the corner. He's the head of the body of Christ as a whole. But when it comes to how you live your day-to-day -day life down here, that order of authority, God always comes first. Ultimately, God is first. But it's God, man, woman, child. As long as that man is not usurping what God says, you're to listen to him. The children, same thing. As long as the parents are, are obeying the word of God and not going against the word of God, they're to listen to him. The Bible says we're to honor our mother and father. Yeah, you honor them. But if they're going, my mom's lost and she's going down the wrong path, I don't go down that path with her. Oh, you should be doing things this way. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this or that. Like when it comes to sin and wickedness. No, I ain't going down that path. Why? Because God comes first. And His Word comes first. And my walk with the Lord comes second. Then the brethren. Then the lost world preaching the gospel, the ministry of reconciliation. But the thing is, sisters in Christ, it's not just you, it's the brethren as a whole, but for what we're talking about here, when you start getting that Jezebel spirit, that Jezebel spirit gets you to start think, putting me, myself, and I first. Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I. I don't have to listen to anybody. No man tells me what to do. I can do what I want when I want. These guys come in here, creep into houses, lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts. Diverse lusts. Ever learning and not able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Diverse lust. That's where that head covering comes in. That's why it's so important. Sisters in Christ, you need to have a head covering. 1 Peter 3 1. 1 Peter 3 1. 
Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Subjection to your own husbands. That if they, if, but if, that if any obey not the word, you have a, a saved husband that seems to be straying from the word. You're still in subjection to him. Meekness. You're supposed to have a meek and quiet spirit. You're supposed to be chaste, the Bible says. Okay? That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversations of, your, of the wives. How you speak to them. It's not saying the wife can lead the husband in any way, shape, or form. It's saying that you say, honey, doesn't the Bible say this? Isn't this going to go against the word of God? I love you. I love you. But I, I can't get back into drinking again. You're getting back into drinking, honey. I can't get back into drinking. You're getting back into Hollywood movies and TV shows. I can't do that. I love the Lord. Why are you trying to get me to turn my back on the Lord? Why are you trying to hurt my walk with the Lord? She's not telling him what to do. She's saying, I can't do this. There's a difference, sisters in Christ. There's a difference. It's one thing to say, hey, you're trying to wreck my walk with the Lord. I can't do that. I love the Lord too much. I love His Word too much. I can't do that. And there's another thing for you to go, you better stop doing this, and you better stop doing that, and, rrr, 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 and I'm not listening to you anymore. Rrr, rrr. Being in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the Word, they also may with the Word be won by the conversation of the, wild, of the wives. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. It's your fear of the Lord that they see in you, sisters in Christ. And the chaste conversation. Verse 3. Whose adoring, let it not be the outward adoring or plaiting of the hair, of the wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. You're saying, I want Jesus to stay on that throne. That husband that's letting Jesus, someone else sit on that throne, whether it's himself or someone else. Jesus needs to be on the throne of my heart. Gee, the hidden man of the heart. Let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the or ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. That's how you win your wife, a husband back to the truth. Not commanding him or usurping his authority. By fearing God and having a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of God of great price. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Verse 5. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also. Remember this. Because it defines what the holy women are in the Old Testament. Also, who trusted in God. Adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. They trusted God. God says you're supposed to have a head covering. It's supposed to be a man down here. You trust God. You're trusting God. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. You're not afraid. You trust God. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 3. Titus chapter 2, verse 3. The aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. What did we just read up there? Holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands. Here we see here, the aged women likewise, that they may be in behavior as becometh holiness. What does it mean becometh holiness? You trust God. You're going to do things God's way because you trust God. But here comes in that Jezebel spirit. Oh, I think God's got it wrong. Oh, no, you don't need a head covering. No, you don't have to be in subjection to your husband. You can be your own man. I mean, own woman. Now, that was a little sarcasm. But, sisters in Christ? Not, how many of you are... Like I said, I have testimonies from sisters in Christ that they struggle with this. They love the Lord. They're trying so hard to live for Him and to do things His way. And these last days, it's not easy. Even the men are struggling to do things God's way in these last days. we got to keep struggling. we got to keep fighting. we got to keep doing what's right. When we fail, we repent, we forsake, we get that failure out, and we get back to walking with the Lord and doing things God's way. 
that they be in behaviors becometh holiness, not false accusers, not giving them much rhyme, teachers of good things, and that goes and lists out those teachers, with, uh, the, the elder women are to teach the younger women those good things. But I want to point that in there, it says, in behaviors becometh holiness. You trust God. God said that God's the head of the, Jesus is the head of the man, the man's the head of the wife, the wife's the head of the children. I'm putting this in because it says the children are not supposed to be ruling over the parents. They're supposed to be honoring their parents and obeying their parents when they're being raised in the admonition of the Lord. Okay? But sisters of Christ, do you trust God? That's what it comes down to, sisters in Christ. Do you trust God? Or do you kick Jesus, God, Jesus Christ, who is God, manifest in the flesh, do you kick him off the throne so the Jezebel spirit can be on the throne? Do you kick him off the throne so you can be on the throne? Bottom line, sisters of Christ, when you reject the head, co the head covering that God gives you, now here it is, it can be a saved father. It can be a lost father that wants to live, uh, tries his best to live a good life, but he hasn't found Christ yet. But it's a father. It's an eldest brother, eldest man in the family. It could be an uncle, an aunt. Um, how many of you read Esther? Esther lost her parents, and she was under her uncle. Right. He was her head covering. It's the eldest man in the family. Okay. If you don't have a father, then it comes to eldest brother. You don't have brothers, then it's the eldest man in the family. Okay. Then there's a husband. If you get married, then it automatically becomes your husband, becomes your head covering. Okay. If you don't have a husband, a pastor, an appointed elder. We read in the Bible that there was uh, women that, um, with the, their husbands passed away, okay? And they were being neglected, the widows were being neglected, and they needed a man, they appointed men, elder men, to take care of those women, to be head coverings for those women, okay? When you reject any notion of a head covering, of a man being an authority over you, a head covering, you're kicking Jesus Christ off the throne. And men, when you let the women do it, you're kicking Jesus Christ off the throne in your heart and letting that woman sit on the throne. Be careful. Be careful. Sisters, I love you. Brothers, I love you. Please take this as an ex exhortation to get back in the scriptures and make sure that Jesus Christ is on the throne. Okay? That's the whole point of this study, is Jesus Christ on the throne. I failed. I've kicked Jesus off the throne plenty of times in my life. I was 100% wrong when I did it. I am without excuse. I'm of the dirt of the ground. I abhor myself. I was reading Job today. I abhor myself. I abhor myself and I sit here in, in, in dust and ashes. Do you come to you got to get to that point where I'm 100% wrong, Lord, you're 100% right, and I'm going to get back to doing things your way. I'm going to get you back on that throne. Now, the next thing that can be on the throne, the world and the people in the world. Okay? 1 John 2.15. First, before we get into this, do you guys remember the story of Saul? I don't have this in my notes. Remember Saul? One of the things he did was is he was supposed to go in and he was supposed to haygag the king and he was supposed to wipe the people out and everything that had to do with the, the, the animals, the spoils, the animals, the gold, everything. They're supposed, to, the, they're supposed to destroy everything. Not the gold, but the animals and everything. And they took the animals and he sat there and said, Oh, I, I, I have sinned. I took the animals because the people wanted the animals. He was a people pleaser. He wasn't a God pleaser. He was a people pleaser. God's will didn't come first. Jesus isn't on the throne. It's the world's on the throne and people in the world because you're too busy trying to uh, fulfill their will and please them. But 1 John 2.17 says, Love not the world, neither things in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. Verse 16. A lot of people don't like to keep reading, but verse 16. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh. What does it mean by love not the world? It's talking about the lust of the flesh. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. My will comes first, or someone else's will comes first. Remember that in respect to persons. 
be careful. That man behind the pulpit, be careful. Are you putting him on the throne and kicking Jesus off the throne? Or is Jesus on the throne and he's a man that's leading you and teaching you the Word of God? And where he errs with this book, do you line up with this book and stick with this book? Or do you follow him because I'm of him? The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I heard someone say once, well, this is just talking about you can't love certain things in the world more than you love God. That's not what this is talking about. It clearly sets it up in verse 16. What is it talking about? It's not talking about loving a pizza more than loving God. Although you shouldn't. That is still wrong. This is talking about the lust of the flesh. If you become so fleshly that that pizza is more important than the Word of God, that pizza is more important than uh, you have a brother in Christ that's hurting that needs help paying a bill, or needs food, or needs raiment. You've got plenty of food at home, but you want to go out for that pizza that you forsake helping that brother or sister in Christ out so you can have your pizza. That's what this is talking about. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what it means by not loving the world. Is the world sitting on the throne, or is Jesus Christ sitting on the throne? Romans 12.2, turn to Romans 12.2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You can submit to God or compromise and conform to the world. Kick Jesus off the throne so the world can sit on the throne. So you can line up with the world. So many people do it in these battle buildings. They do it in these battle buildings. I'm of this group. I'm of that group. Brothers, the sisters of Christ, I'm of the church of God, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. I belong to the Lord, period. Do you belong to the Lord, or do you belong to that Babel building? Do you belong to the Lord, or do you belong to this social group that's on YouTube? There are groups on YouTube that are acting just like the Babel buildings. I'm of that man. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When this world goes against the scriptures, do you stick with the scriptures, brothers and sisters Christ? James 4.4 4. James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This is instruction in righteousness. James isn't written for us today, but instruction in righteousness, this applies all through every dispensation. It's either God's way or it's the world's way. You can't have both. Only one person can be sitting on that throne. Now I say person, I say the world, but there's people in the world. I'm of him. I'm of that person. Only one person can be sitting on the throne. I better not be sitting on the throne. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hardly anybody. I'm not popular. I'm not, you know, I, I never want to be. I'm not famous. I never want to be. Uh, but there are men out there, like I see some people, some people still worship uh, Peter Ruckman, and Peter Ruckman's sitting on the throne. He's a great man of God. I learned a lot from him. But Peter Ruckman's not supposed to be sitting on the throne. Anytime Peter Ruckman says something that's wrong, and I say, hey, this is wrong, they get on to me saying, how dare I question the man of God? Why? Because Peter Ruckman's still sitting on the throne. They kick Jesus Christ off and put Peter Ruckman on there. They kick Jesus Christ off and put Brian Denlinger on there. They kick Jesus Christ off and put David Daniels on there. They kick Jesus Christ off and put uh, Sam Gipp on there. They kick Jesus Christ and put whoever Whoever they're following in these Babel buildings. I just show, I just mentioned the men that taught me the Word of God that I learned from. And I had to get to a point that when they start going left or right, I need to stay on the straight and narrow. Why? Because Jesus is on the throne, not them. Jesus is the final authority. His Word is the final authority, not them. And when they're not doing things God's way, you don't follow them. When they are doing things God's way, you follow God's way and you line up with the Scriptures. No matter how you look at it, you don't follow them. You follow Jesus Christ. If they line up with the Word of God and they're following Jesus Christ, then you're following Jesus Christ. 
If they don't, you need to be following Jesus Christ. John 12, 42. John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many people on many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. I almost I don't know if I I was wronged by a brother in Christ, a mentor, and I had brethren tell me quietly, privately, they believe he was wrong in what he did. But they don't dare go tell him to his face. Why? Because they don't want to be put out of that little group that they're part of. That social group. That club. But they told me, hey, I, I, I still agree with him. I think you're wrong when it came to the scriptures. But how he treated you was 100% wrong. 100% wrong according to the Bible. But they won't do it openly. Why? Because they might get kicked out of the group. Uh, I had to take some courage and finally stand up to my mentor. I'm not going to name names because I don't want this to be a, a big fighting battle. But I had to stand up to him when it came to the Word of God where I saw that he was erring from the Word of God. And you know what? I knew it could cost me that fellowship. Anytime you stand up to a brother or sister in Christ, it can cost you that fellowship. But I fear God more than I fear losing that fellowship. I fear it. I don't want to lose fellowship with anyone. I miss my brothers in Christ that I've lost fellowship with. I miss them. I don't want to lose fellowship with anybody. But I fear God more than I fear losing that fellowship. And there's times where I didn't. I feared losing that fellowship and I kept my mouth shut. For they love the praise of men more than they love than the praise of God. They rather hear that man say, well done, thou good and faithful one, than hearing God say, well done, thou good and faithful one. I want to hear God say it. And that's what I'm in today. That's how God's far God's got me in my walk with Him. I want Him to say it. When a brother says, hey, you're doing right, lining up according to the Scriptures, pat on the back, okay, praise God, that's an encouragement, that's exhort exhortation, that's great, that's wonderful. But the number one person I want to hear say it is Jesus Christ. Who's on the throne? Is Jesus Christ on the throne? Or did you let some other man sit on there and you're starting to do respecter of persons and that man becomes a lowercase g God? Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Men of the world. Matthew 15, 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your traditions? By your traditions. Have you figured out what I'm going to say that's on the throne now? Traditions of men. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift. Give me a gift. By whatsoever thou mightst be profited by me, and honor not his father and his mother, he shall be free. In other words, they made this tradition where basically if you pay me enough, I'll look the other way. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. Brothers, sisters in Christ, have traditions gotten on the cross on the on the throne? Did Jesus get kicked off the throne and now you're, you're being led by men who are pushing traditions? Whatever man it is that's sitting on the cross that's pushing traditions over the commandments of God? Once again, it comes back to being a respecter of persons, but sometimes it's, it's traditions. You go against the traditions, you're going to get bullied these days. I give you a tradition, building a building, calling it a church, inviting both saved and lost to it, which goes 100% against the scriptures. You want to build a building that has, that's a meeting house or a prayer house? That's fine. But they're treating that building as if it's a temple. And they are. They are. They try to deny it all they want, but they are. Where did they get that from? The Word of God? No. Where would they get that from? Wearing Sunday best? Pulpit? Altar calls? Where did they get that from? Traditions of men. They didn't get it from the Word of God. Verse 7, 
Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, and I've left out the 10% tithe. Where did they get the 10% tithe? The Old Testament. But that's not how we're supposed to be doing things today. That, that's traditions of men. Where did they get the 10% tithe originally? They got it from traditions of men. Where did traditions of men get it from? They try to grab it from the Old Testament and pull it forward to today, and it's not for today. That was another thing. But ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh to me with their mouth, and on me with their lips. We call it lip, you know. Words. Good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. But their heart is far from me. Their walk doesn't line up with their talk. Because if they did, where it says, um, they draw nigh with me with their lip mouths and on me with their lips, they'd be doing things God's way. And they wouldn't let traditions of men get in the way. Their actions say the opposite. I've come across a lot of people like that. They say one thing and do another. They, the Bible calls that hypocrisy. But some of them, with what we're reading here, some of them have this great, the, with, with the mouth, they, can know, they really know how to praise God. They can sing hymns. They know how to praise God with their lips. But does their life praise God? Does their life line up with this book? Are they, does their life please God? That's what this is talking about. But their heart is far from me. They're not living for Jesus Christ. They talk the talk, but they're not walking the walk. Nine, but in vain do they worship me. Like I said, they can sing. Oh, they can sing great. But in vain they do worship me. Teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of men. Brothers, says Christ, who's on the throne? Is it God's doctrines? Is it God's commandments? Because Jesus is on the throne. He's commanding. He's telling us how to live and telling us how to do things. He's doing it through uh, preachers and teachers, through men of God that are called to be preachers and teachers. Doing it through husbands that are washing their wife by the watering of the word. Doing it through uh, sisters of Christ, mothers that are raising their children in the admonition of the Lord. You raise them to fear God and that we do things God's way. That's the admonition of the Lord. Okay? They acknowledge that God's the one in charge, and He says to do something, that's how we're supposed to do it. And you're to fear not following God's commands. Okay? God calls those people out there, absolutely, to preach and teach these things. But when push comes to shove, when you start to disagree on anything, this is what we're all supposed to agree on, 100%. This is absolute truth. And I'm telling you right now, anytime there's been division in the body of Christ, it's because Jesus Christ is not on the throne on one side or both sides. And the Bible says, only by pride cometh contentions. When you see division in the body of Christ, it's because one side or both sides are so prideful and they're both sitting on the throne. They're both sitting on the throne. And we're going to get into this a little bit more later when it talks about when we get to the cross. Colossians 2.8 Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Not after Christ? You mean Jesus isn't sitting on the throne? When you're going off philosophy and vain deceit and you're putting the traditions of men and the rudiments of the world first, Jesus isn't on the throne? No, he isn't. I know great men of God, great men of God that were spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit. No matter how many times you try to ask them chapter and verse, they don't care. They're going to hold on to their traditions. They're going to do things the way the church fathers did it. A lot of things the church fathers got, they got from the Reformation. A lot of things the, Reforma the, the people in the Reformation got, they got it from Catholicism. Because they were coming out of Catholicism, but they didn't come out of Catholicism completely. Be careful. Thus saith the Lord, chapter and verse. That's our foundation. When Jesus is on the cross, it's chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. Thus saith the Lord. You know, them telling you, you to be a good Christian, you have to go to a good local New Testament church. I'm talking about a building, not a people, building. And you go, chapter and verse. Oh, we don't care what the Bible says. We love our traditions. Spoiled. 
That's the way the world is today. Brother and sister Christ is Jesus on the cross. Last but not least, do you know who else can be on the cross? Satan. Now stop for a second. You say, well, I can't be devil-possessed. Well, I'm not saying you can be possessed by your wife either. I'm just saying this is a throne that whoever's sitting on that throne, brother says Christ, that's the one who's in charge. That's the one you're following. That's the one you're listening to. That's the one whose will comes first. That's the one you're obeying. Could Satan be on that, cross, on that throne? Could his ministers that are transformed into the ministers of righteousness, the children of the devil, could they be sitting on the throne? John 8.43, turn to John 8.43. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. What gets in the way of Jesus Christ being on the throne? Verse 44. Ye are the, your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Now, like I said, the lost world has a throne in their heart. And like I said, all these things we talk about, any one of these can be on that throne, but they don't have a cross. Satan can be on the throne. Okay. Why won't they get saved? Because they won't kick Satan off the throne to let Jesus come in and save them and be on the throne. They won't kick the world off the throne so Jesus can be on the throne. They won't kick whoever, wives, children, me, myself, and I, they won't kick them off the throne. When you come to God broken, you're coming off the cross. Are you coming off the throne? I'm getting ahead of myself. When you get saved, brothers and Christ, you get off that throne and you come to Calvary. And you fall down before the Lord at Calvary. Jesus gets off the cross, gets on the throne, and you get on the cross. What prevents people from getting saved? They will not get off the throne. Or wherever they're following, they won't kick them off the throne to put Jesus Christ on the throne. Why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? The Bible says that the gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. People who don't want to get saved, they love their sin. And what they do is they try to find a back door. God helped us, oh, it's an old study we did five years ago, four years ago. It's called finding the back door, question mark. We're not supposed to be finding the back door. We're supposed to find the way, the truth, and the life. The real Jesus Christ. The real plan of salvation. There's only one door. That's Jesus Christ. There's only one way to heaven. And we've already talked about it. Verse 44. Ye of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's Satan. You really want him on the throne? And what I mean for a saved sinner, how can Satan be on the throne? We'll get to there, we'll get to there. But bottom line, are you doing things God's way? Or me, my, the flesh's way? Are you doing things God's way? Or the world's way? Are you doing things God's way? Or you've been deceived into doing things Satan's way? If you're doing things God's way, the Bible way, Jesus is on the, on the throne. If you're doing things the flesh's way, me and myself and I are on the throne. If you're doing things the world's way, the world and people in the world are on the throne. And if you find yourself doing things Satan's way, doctrines of devils, I'm getting ahead of myself, then Jesus isn't on the cross. All right? 1 Timothy 4.1. Here we are. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith means they were in the faith. They believed the truth, but now they've turned their back on it. They depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. A good example of this is people that go from being pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catch away the body of Christ, to post and mid-trib. Those are doctrines of devils. People who used to believe that, hey, you're, you're sealed into the day of redemption. These things that I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. But you have eternal, that eternal security. You're secure, and you have eternal life. Now they're trying to say, eh, there might be some ways you can lose it. What is that? They're getting over to doctrines of devils. They're also resting the scriptures to their own destruction because in order to prove that you can lose it, they've got to go to uh, Hebrews. 
First uh, and Second Peter, Hebrews, James. Yeah, that's where they're going. Or they go to the Old Testament. The, go the Gospels are not the New Testament until Jesus Christ dies on the cross. So stuff that's before that is in the Old Testament. Now, if Jesus prophesies of them things in the future. Remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Things that were written before time were written for our learning. And in Timothy, he says that even the uh, words of our Lord Jesus, Jesus did say some things about today that we're supposed to listen to. Okay? We can learn from everything Jesus said. Period. We don't ignore what Jesus said in the Gospels. Period. But there's instruction righteousness in the Gospels. And then there's doctrine that's for today when Jesus is prophesying the time of the Gentiles. How he should die and that salvation would go out to the world, that's for today. But when he's preaching the kingdom of heaven, that's not for today. Okay, you have to rightly divide. Study, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But you have doctrines of devils, people who once stood for the truth. Um, those are the best examples I can just throw out there, you know, but another one, a brother in Christ that I just butted heads with, uh, he used to believe, he used to believe that in the order of authority that God set up, God, man, woman, child, he believed it until he got married. Who talked him out of that belief? His wife did. His wife got him to turn his back on God. And what did he go to? Doctrines of devils. What is that? He's falling away. Some shall depart from the faith. I believe he's saved. I believe he's saved 100%. But he's falling away. The Bible talks about that falling away. And when you start falling away and you get into doctrines of devils, who's sitting on the throne? Who's sitting on the throne? Is Jesus on the throne? Or did you let your wife get on the throne? Okay. And that wife that's trying to be on the throne and get you to kick Jesus off the throne, who's on her throne of her heart? That Jezebel spirit? Satan? Verse 2, speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When you get to this point where you're hardcore falling away, I used to believe this, but now I believe that, the Bible's got your number. You've seared your conscience with a hot iron because you're, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your conscience, and that's how you get convicted. But if you sear that conscience, you don't have to listen to the Holy Spirit anymore. You block them out. Who's on the throne? That doctrines of devils. Satan, be careful. Make sure that your doctrine lines up 100% with the Pauline epistles. I had, uh, I disagree with Peter Ruckman. I'm sorry, I disagree with Peter Ruckman. Peter Ruckman grabbed from James and said, um, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask a God that abradeth not, and give it, to all men no, give it to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. See, that's doctrine for today. That's not doctrine. That's instruction in righteousness. That applies to all dispensations. You want wisdom? Who do you go to get the wisdom from? God. King David went there. Saul went to God. King David went to God. Samuel went to God. Noah went to God. We read about that in the beginning. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. What do I do? They're seeking knowledge from God and wisdom from God. That's every dispensation. That's called instruction and in righteousness. And sometimes Peter Ruckman had a hard time between instruction and righteousness, how your day-to-day -day living, and what's just living right in God's eyes, versus doctrines. You want to know what doctrines are, brothers of Christ? The gospel for today. It's found in the Pauline epistles. The fact that we are sealed into the day of redemption, the teaching that they call eternal security, because we're secure and we have eternal life. That's taught in the Pauline epistles. You find that in the Pauline epistles. When people get messed up on that, it's because they're going outside the Pauline epistles. Getting into Hebrews, getting into James, 2 Peter. All right? They start reading those so-called churches in Revelation. Those aren't churches for today. Okay, we can learn from them. There's a lot of instruction in righteousness. But the moment it talks about how some of those churches can lose their salvation, we know it's not for today. Period. Period. Okay? So eternal security. The Godhead, we get, the Godhead gets revealed to us in the Pauline epistles, what it is. Now, the Godhead was there from the very beginning. 
but it gets revealed to us in the Pauline epistles. The pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Where do we get this? The day of Christ is at hand, looking for that blessed hope, that he might redeem us from this wicked world. Where do we get that from? The Pauline epistles. When people get this all messed up, the posty toasties and the post and mid trim, where do they go? They go outside the Pauline epistles and they get messed up. They go to the uh, Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 24, Mark 13, I think it is. And I forgot what Luke, what the chapter is in Luke. They go to the Old Testament. The body of Christ leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble is revealed to us in the Pauline epistles. These are what's called doctrines. These are teachings that are fundamental, foundational for believing in, in this life, in this dispensation. That's what doctrines are. But some of the brethren are mistaking instruction and righteousness for doctrine. That's instruction and righteousness. I've read from other dispensations in this, in this study alone. You know, but their instruction and righteousness. We're talking about the changed life, our walk with the Lord, who's on the throne and who else, who's, who's on the throne and who's on the cross is what we're going to be talking about. You need to get that down, brothers and sisters in Christ. You've got to get that down. Some of the brethren, like I said, they get so messed up because they're taking things that are instruction and righteousness and other, dispensa taught in other books uh, and other dispensations, and they're making them doctrine and saying, see, we can go all over the Bible for doctrine for today. It's the Pauline epistles, and they'll accuse me of being a uh, hyper-dispensationalist. No, Jesus talked about today, but it's re-mentioned by Paul. We can learn some things in Hebrews and uh, 1 Peter that's ta that Paul talks about. But it's the Pauline epistles where we get those major doctrines. The gospel for today. Paul said the gospel for today was revealed to me, to you, word. Call me what you want. I'm a King James Bible believer, and I believe in 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. 1 Peter 5, 6. 1 Peter 5, 6. Remember, this is 1 Peter. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and that he may exalt you in due time. That's, that's instruction in righteousness for us today. Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that some the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Well, that's doctrine. No, it's instruction righteous. Don't you remember? I just got finished reading Job. Job is a man that's a type of man that overcame Satan. He, Satan tried to devour him. Right? That's been going on since, since Satan fell. He devoured Adam and Eve, got, got Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You say, well, this is Peter. Let's keep going. Let's go to James. Let's go to James. James 4, 7. You say, this is still not for today. Doctrinally, it's not for today. But instruction righteousness, 4, 7. How do you live day to day? You're supposed to be sober and be vigilant. Because Satan's going to get... He can't prevent you from getting saved, brothers says Christ. This... That is for saved sinners. You get saved, you get born again. What does Satan do? He tries everything he can to mess you up and to mess your walk up with the Lord. He comes in with lusts of the flesh, worldliness, tra traditions of men, uh, culture, okay, and um, the spirit of Jezebel, turning the women against the men, turning the children against the parents. He's doing everything he can to ruin our walk with the Lord. And that's where instruction and righteousness comes in. Our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord. How to please God. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Well, that's doctrine. No, it's instruction and righteousness. In order to resist the devil, you've got to submit yourself to God. That's true in every dispensation. Period. It's instruction and in righteousness. Turn to Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12. Here's the Pauline epistles. This is what we just read in 1 Peter and James. Here's Ephesians 
the Pauline epistles. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And if you keep reading, it talks about standing against Satan, against standing against the devil. You have the shield of faith that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. It's talking about the devil. It's talking about Satan. You see how that works? It's mentioned in the Pauline epistles. That's why we can go to James and 1 Peter for instruction righteous and say this all applies. Okay? We have to be sober. We have to be vigilant. Putting on the whole armor of God. And when you have the whole armor of God... You're submitting yourself to God, and you're able to resist the devil, and he will flee. He has to flee. Okay. Who's on the cross, brother, says Christ? Who's on the cross? Is Satan on the cross? Or not cross, I'm sorry. Brother. Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Is Satan on the throne? Or is Jesus Christ on the throne? Are you doing things Satan's way? You drop that shield, so all those darts come in, and you start getting into doctrines of devils, and you start doing things Satan's way. Or is Jesus Christ still on the throne? And here we get to it. I know we could have probably done some more, but then we get to this. Please bear with me. I thank the Lord for your patience, brother, sister Christ, to bear with me this long. Jesus Christ. Now we keep saying this, is Jesus Christ on the throne or is this on the throne? Is Jesus Christ on the throne or is this on the throne? Now we're going to get to Jesus Christ. How is, how, what's the evidence that Jesus Christ is on the throne? And turn to Matthew 11, 26. Matthew 11, 26. But this is Christ. I pray that Jesus is on the throne. And if for whatever reason he got kicked off the throne, I pray through this study that you are able to get Jesus back on the throne and kick whoever else is on the throne. Even if you have to kick yourself in the butt to get you off the throne and get Jesus Christ back on the throne. Matthew eleven twenty nine. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. When Jesus is in charge and he's on the throne, you have a yoke around your neck. He's, it's like a man in a wagon and you're the horse and you've got the yoke on your neck and he tells you where to go, where not to go, what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you can do, what you're not supposed to do. He's in charge. That's what it means to have a yoke on you. Jesus Christ is in charge. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and you shall find rest in your souls. 2 Corinthians 5.20 2 Corinthians 5.20 Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Everything we talked about, when you put yourself on the throne, you're representing yourself. When you put the world on the throne, you represent the world. When you put Satan on the throne, you represent Satan. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be a represent, representing Jesus Christ to this dark world, this lost, wicked world. You can't do that if Jesus isn't on the throne. Now then, ye are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Ephesians 6.20 reads, Ephesians 6.20, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. He's speaking for Jesus Christ. He's pre pre preaching the gospel. He's preaching the word of God. We get the Pauline epistles. He's preaching how we're supposed to live today, how we're supposed to treat one another, how we correct one another, how we're supposed to love one another, reprove one another if necessary. He teaches us the doctrines that are for today. He's an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And Peter, I'll have this in my notes, but in Peter it talks about be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. We're all supposed to do that. That's instruction righteousness. We're all supposed to do that. You always give the hope. Read if you if you believe that's just for today and it's doctrine in another book that's for a different dispensation and it's for today, then what about King David? Why don't you read the Psalms sometimes? Was he ready to, to give an answer to the hope that's in him? Read the Psalms. Where was his hope? It was in God and everything that God did for him. John 14, 15. John 14, 15. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. Jump down to 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. How do you know Jesus is sitting on the cross? You're, or not on the cross, sitting on the throne. How do you know Jesus is sitting on the throne? You're keeping his commandments. You're keeping his word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify unto thy truth, thy word is truth. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How do you know Jesus is on the throne? He's the one commanding. He commands, we obey. It's that simple. Are traditions of men on the throne? Because they're, the uh, they're the ones commanding. Is your wife on the throne? They're the ones commanding. Your children on the throne? Is me, myself, and I on the throne? They're the ones commanding and getting you to obey them. Is Jesus on the throne? Then you're doing what Jesus says and he comes first. Luke 6, 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? I had to throw that in there. Remember we talked about, they t we read over here where they, with their words and their lips. Here it is. Uh, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. And why call ye me Lord, Lord? But their heart is far from me. And do not the things that I say. These are people that, are, that Jesus Christ isn't on the cross, on the throne. He's not on the throne. Acts 4.10 be it known unto you all, be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. Peter just healed a man outside the synagogue. Verse 11. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When you get saved, Jesus gets on the throne. He's the head of the corner. He's the head of the church. It's His way. He's the boss. He's the ultimate boss. The order of authority. It's God first. Man, woman, child. And sometimes I put God at the bottom only because, not because he's below everybody, but I always say he's the foundation. Starts with God and ends with God. No matter what gets put in between, it starts with God and it ends with God. Every time. He's the head of the corner. He's the foundation. 1 Corinthians 3.11 For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ is the foundation, he's on the cross. I mean, he's on the throne. He's on the throne, and He's in charge of your life. He commands, you obey. You're not treating Jesus as the foundation or the head of the corner if you put let somebody else on that throne. You kick Jesus off and let somebody else sit on that throne. You're not being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ either. John 15, 14 said, You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Did Jesus not lay down his life for the world and for those who get saved? When you get saved, Jesus becomes your friend because he laid down his life. Now, are you his friend? How many of you hear people say, I'm Jesus' friend? The Bible says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. A lot of these, like I said, I came from the easy believism world. Okay? They're not the friend of Jesus Christ. They're a friend of the flesh. They're a friend of the world. We talked about them being a friend of the world. They're the enemy of God if you're a friend of the world. Now, saved sinners, can they start acting like enemies of God because they start becoming a friend of someone like the flesh, the world, Satan, and stop being a friend of Jesus Christ? Because you're not doing whatsoever he commands you. Can you start looking like the world again? Failing the Lord. And not being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ. Yes. Get whatever's on that throne that's getting in the way. And you kick it off. And you get Jesus Christ back on the throne, brothers and sisters in Christ. Acts 20.28. Acts 20.28. 20, 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Does God, does Jesus, when Jesus sits on the throne, he owns you. That yoke that's on you, he owns you. You're a bondservant to Jesus Christ. He owns you. You know, I've come across easy believism people that say, nobody owns me. Jesus doesn't own me. I'm not a bondservant. I'm not, I'm nobody's slave. 1 Corinthians 6.19, 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know ye not? This was the one where, I can't remember, but there's the verse in Romans, I think it is. I have bad time with addresses sometimes. Forgive me, brothers of Christ, but it says, Are we to sin that grace may get bound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Why? 1 Corinthians 6.19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Why? For ye are bought with the price, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For ye are bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which he hath purchased with his own blood, and in your spirit, which he hath purchased with his own blood, which are God's. Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Is he sitting on the throne, commander in chief? Do you belong to him? Are you still your own man or your own woman? Nobody tells me what to do. Who's on the throne? Evidence of Jesus being on the throne is he's, He commands you obey. And when you fail Him, you come back to Him, fall on your knees, kick whoever's off the cross. You have to go back to the cross, say, Lord, I'm sorry. Pick up your cross that you dropped. And we're going to get into this, the cross that's in here also. You, pick, you go back to the cross, you pick up that cross, and you let Jesus get back on the throne. You repent, you forsake, and you get back to your heart right with the Lord. He's on the throne. He tells me what to do and I do it. 1 Corinthians 7.23 You are bought with the price. Be not the servants of men. Once again, does Jesus own you? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Or is it starting to look more like you belong to yourself? No man tells me what to do. Self-willed that we talked about? Being self-willed, my will comes first. I want, I want the world. Do you act like you, the, you, do you start to live like the world owns you? The flesh owns you? The world owns you? Satan owns you? Are you actually living as if you're an ambassador? Living, not like, but living an ambassador for Jesus Christ. God owns you. Jesus owns you. He bought you. 1 Timothy 6.15, we're going to go through these. 1 Timothy, we're going to go through these next, you don't have to turn here, but 1 Timothy 6.15 says, Which in times he shall show who is the only who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, so that every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. At some point after the kingdom of heaven, the day of the Lord, Okay, where he's ruling and reigning for a thousand years, Satan's let loose. There's some time period after that, Satan's let loose. God destroys the heaven and the earth. You have the great white throne judgment. At some point, everybody is going to be bound to him. And he's going to be sitting on a throne. And he, they're going to be saying he's king of kings and lord of lords. He's the Lord who is come in the flesh. Revelation 19.16, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you treat him as such, brother, says Christ? Yes, one of the titles of Jesus is friend. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. One of his titles is friends, but sometimes you can get too familiar with the Lord and you don't treat him like he's God Almighty. You don't treat Jesus like he's a capital K king of lowercase k kings, a capital L lord of lowercase L lords. You can get too familiar. And when you get too familiar, and you're not, when you come to that throne that's in here, you come to him humbling yourself and bowing before him and worshiping him. Or do you come to him as best buds to the point where you can get the courage to kick him off the throne because you get too familiar with him? Because we're just friends, we're just best buds. Walk up to him on the throne and just slap him on the chest. What's up, homeboy? What's up, buddy? Or would you come and fall down before him at the throne? Brothers, this is Christ. It's something to think about. 
Revelation 17, 14, this also says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For He is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with Him are called and chosen and faithful. I'm not going to get into that too much, because people say, look, it says called, chosen, faithful. I believe that the people that come down with Jesus Christ are the ones who suffered with Him. Remember what it says, if you suffer with him, you shall also reign with him. But if you deny him, in other words, you kick him off the cross and you start becoming part of the falling away and you're no longer suffering for Jesus Christ by putting the flesh down, by the way the world treats you, by the way Satan and his ministers try to come after us. When you stop suffering for him, you won't reign with him. You lose that inheritance. So those are the called, chosen, and faithful. But he's called Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Brothers, this Christ is Jesus Christ on the throne. Turn to Jeremiah 6.16. I love Jeremiah 6.16. 6, I know a lot of you brothers Christ know which one this is. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the way, and see, and ask for the old paths. Who are you asking? You're asking God. Show me the way, the right way, that's considered old today. No, no, we got to have the new way, the new way, the world, the flesh, Satan. Ask for the old path, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, they said, the world, we will not walk therein. Brother, says Christ, if you, kick, say, uh, if you kick Jesus off the throne, what you're doing is you're saying, I will not walk therein. I don't want to do things God's way. They is supposed to be the world, the lost world. Why are some of the brethren starting to act and look like the lost world? I don't want thing, I don't I don't want to do things God's way. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. Oh no, no, I don't want to do things God's way. Rewa um, we're not supposed to reward evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now you got brethren that are mocking, name calling, backbiting and whispering, railing for railing, bearing false witness, they're getting into the drama, the arguing, the fighting, the division. That's not God's way. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If someone calls you names, you don't turn around and call them names. You don't reward evil with evil. They mock you and make a, try to make you look like a fool. You don't mock them. They lie about you, bearing false witness. You don't turn around and lie about them. They talk about you behind your back to anyone and everyone. You don't, you don't talk about people behind their back. Backbiting and whispering. And I have to throw this in real quick, brothers. Talking to the camera is still not talking to the person themselves. It's still considered backbiting and whispering if you're talking about people behind a camera and yet you never went to them to talk to them first. If you tried talking to them, they wouldn't listen. You use them as a bad example in a good Bible study. But like I said, just making a video where it's all about just hammering that guy and making that guy look bad and just... It becomes like a gossip thing. You know, I can get as much junk from one of those magazines that's gossiping about people that you see when you go to the register as, as in those videos where the brethren aren't turning it into a Bible study to exhort the brethren, to encourage the brethren to do what's right and to stay on the right path and what is true. Brothers of Christ, are you starting to have the attitude, we will not walk therein? I don't want Jesus. You're starting to have the attitude where you're acting like the lost world. You don't want Jesus on the throne. With the life that you're living, it's not just your words. It's your deeds. 1 Samuel 8, 7. 1 Samuel 8, 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should reign over them. Who's on the throne, brother, sis Christ? 